Hello, I'm Marcus Louth and welcome to the latest edition of the UFO Insight Podcast, where we will examine all things UFOs and aliens, conspiracies and mysteries, and all aspects of the paranormal. Okay, today we'll be turning our attention to what the reasons might be for UFO secrecy. Just why is evidence and knowledge of these apparent visitors from other worlds withheld from the general public? While we have seen some admissions of UFOs in recent years, disclosure, as most of us would understand it, still appears far away. Now there could be many legitimate reasons to keep information on UFOs secret, not least for national security. However, the more researchers have investigated the subject of UFOs and just what might be behind them, the more it appears there is much more to this secrecy than just protecting a government's secrets. It is perhaps worth noting, for example, that the National Security Act came into being approximately six weeks after the Roswell crash. Now is that coincidence? Possibly so, but we should certainly keep it in mind. Just why are those who hold power over all of us seemingly withholding information from the rest of humanity? And as much as the following, by nature of the subject, is very much speculation, might it be time that we at least contemplate such seemingly outlandish notions before it becomes too late to do so? There is most definitely a hidden truth to be found within the murkiness and intentionally blurred lines of the UFO and alien question. Okay, perhaps the most widely suggested reason for UFO secrecy is the fact that should the world be told of the existence of extraterrestrials, ones that were visiting Earth no less, then society would ultimately break down. And how this would look is just as speculative, perhaps not least dependent on whether these arriving aliens are friendly or hostile. Now let's assume the latter for a moment. If we were faced with a hostile alien race, would humanity unite together? Or would, as some have suggested, there be a breakdown across all parts of society? Essentially that people would perhaps panic, and certainly wouldn't just carry on as normal. Many people would likely head out of large cities in anticipation of some kind of attack, while others would hole up in their properties. After all, we know that many people have such shelters built into their homes today, complete with months and months of food supplies for just such an end-of-the-world event. And while these suggestions might be of a worst-case scenario, they don't paint a pretty picture. There would potentially be the sudden erosion of law enforcement, hospitals, schools and other public services. Most leisure facilities and supermarkets would cease trading. As a result, looting of products, particularly food, would become widespread. Indeed, we might imagine a purge-type scenario, where only the worst elements of society left in these larger cities would take over the streets. There is also the religion aspect of such an announcement. Would all religion suddenly lose its validity? Would people suddenly cease believing in their chosen faith when confronted with the existence of intelligent life from other worlds deep in space? Okay, here it is probably worth our time examining the apparent War of the Worlds fake alien invasion broadcast of the 1930s. Now, according to many reports of the time, multiple citizens around the United States would leave the cities fearing an actual alien invasion. There are even reports of suicides from some panic-stricken residents. We should note also, however, that in recent times there has been doubt cast on the authenticity of such claims of mass panic by the population. Might this suggest, then, that such reports were manufactured and placed into the public consciousness as accepted fact in order to justify such a tight grip on detailed information? Perhaps as a discreet afterthought, we should ask just why it was considered a worthwhile exercise in the first place. Was it purely for fun and just to see what happened? Or were authorities looking to record just what the reaction would be should such an announcement be real? And if that is the case, then just what did they know about extraterrestrial life in the 1930s, a decade before the alleged Roswell crash? Would that really be the reaction of most people around the world? Many people are hard-pressed to lend credence to such a notion. Indeed, would society really be so quick to fold, particularly if there was no evidence these speculative cosmic visitors were a threat to humanity? Perhaps we, and they, if this is a reason for UFO secrecy, should give humanity a little more credit. It is not that much of a stretch of the imagination that the vast majority, while undoubtedly cautiously, would take such developments in their collective stride. Of course, what would happen after an initial announcement of the existence of alien life visiting the Earth would very much depend on just how involved these extraterrestrials wish to be. Would they simply be on a space exploring mission that would lead them far away from Earth after making contact? Or would they be looking to negotiate, or simply enforce their way onto the planet for a more permanent presence?
If we return to the religion perspective for a moment, particularly in light of such trains of thought as the ancient astronaut theory, might there be more credibility in the claims of extraterrestrial influence, whether intentional or not, with almost all of the religions we see today? Might this be the reason for the secrecy behind UFO sightings? After all, the majority of those of a religious persuasion would no doubt handle a disclosure of information in their stride, and most importantly, peacefully, even if that disclosure made them reassess their own beliefs. However, as unsavoury as it is, there will undoubtedly be within all of the religions of the world small select ardent hardline groups, which very well might use such an incident to trigger violence between themselves and those who accept such blasphemous preaching. In short, however small such pockets of resistance to information might be, a new era of zealot-type religious warfare could be triggered by such information. Now that is not to say that the general public should be held ransom by the potential actions of what is essentially an extremely small part of the world's population. However, it is certainly a reaction and subsequent situation that we should be aware of. Maybe the world's governments, as well as the respective leaders of the different religious perspectives, have also taken such apparent consequences of the releasing of groundbreaking historic information into consideration. Indeed, as overdramatic as it might be, such religious violence against a backdrop of momentous releasing of information could very well lead to a doomsday end of day scenario. Armageddon, in a bizarre way, could prove to be self-fulfilling as opposed to the fate of humanity. While the idea of self-fulfilling prophecies is really enough, there is also perhaps the possibility of hijacking of such disclosure and knowledge of an alien presence from presently unknown organisations, ones that don't currently even exist, but could come together by pure chance in the potential mass exodus of people from the world cities. While we mentioned the genuine possibility of a dark or unsavoury element of society filling the void of this mass exodus, within that there would very likely be opportunistic people who would look to organise this unsavoury element for their own ends, whether territorial or even political. Indeed, there could very well be a whole host of problems and issues that while we can broadly predict, the specifics of which would catch humanity very much on the back foot. There is another thing to consider. And we will examine this under the assumption for a moment that this speculative alien race was benevolent and as such society hadn't broken down as we have speculated before. There could be pockets of people around the planet who would be suspicious and untrusting of these cosmic visitors and ultimately resistant to their presence. And while such a stance should be confronted and resisted, it would still potentially present a danger to both the rest of humanity and this speculative alien race. Indeed, radicalisation of many things could prove to be a genuine concern amongst such seismic reality-altering revelations. And it isn't just unsavoury groups that might present humanity with genuine issues in the event of a disclosure of information. In a similar way to the self-fulfilling prophecies, there could be groups or organisations who very well might not be able to resist, perhaps even on a subconscious level, allowing their beliefs to come to fruition. As unlikely as it sounds, at least some extreme elements of otherwise legitimate, well-intentioned organisations could very well act in such a manner. When we consider these unknown elements, particularly when we add in the variable of not knowing just how society as a whole would react, it is broadly not understandable that such an approach of remaining tight-lipped on UFOs and aliens has been taken. In that sense, we might ask what we as a collective can do to alter this perception. As we examined in our first episode looking at what UFOs might actually be, there have been suggestions that they are the result of advanced human-made technology, experimental aerial vehicles, and as such are off limits to the public, perhaps for reasons of national security. And let's be honest, that is not that much of a stretch of the imagination. If there is any truth in these suggestions though, just what are the reasons for these apparently highly advanced aircraft in the first place? Are they futuristic reconnaissance vehicles used to spy on the activities of perceived enemies and hostile nations? Or might these advanced aircraft operate much further afield than the skies of Earth? Indeed, could there be any truth to the long rumoured suggestions of a secret space programme? Could these human operated vehicles be venturing much deeper into space than the public are told? Perhaps they are even vehicles that somehow travel to other dimensions. And of course, we have to consider, even if UFOs are the result of top-secret military programs, have they been built using alien technology? 
and while this could be from reverse engineering allegedly recovered alien technology from downed craft, there have been suggestions that contact was made decades ago and a secret deal for advanced technology was made by the government and an alien race, specifically the Greys. We will not go over the details in full here, but the apparent crucial year when this deal took place was 1954, when President Eisenhower, who was officially undergoing emergency dental treatment, was actually, according to the claims, meeting representatives from the Greys, eventually striking a deal with them. The basics of this deal were advanced technology from the Greys in return for access to human subjects for tests. Would a president of their own country really make such a deal? While on the surface it sounds highly unlikely, it is claimed that there had been issued a guy's threat during this apparent meeting from the Greys to Eisenhower, that should he not agree to the deal, they would seek an audience with the leaders of the Soviet Union, and enter the same deal with them. This would, of course, shift the balance of power decidedly to the East, and such a development would be seen as a threat to American security. It is certainly an interesting claim, and as outlandish as it sounds, if we accept just for a moment its authenticity, it would certainly result in the desire and indeed necessity from a government standpoint to protect such deals from public knowledge. Of course, and by definition, there is very little solid proof of these secret deals. There are, however, numerous whistleblowers and high-ranking government and military officials who have gone on record to state such notions are not that far from our reality. We should also consider, however briefly, the claims and conspiracies that surfaced in the 1990s of an apparent battle between humans and extraterrestrials at underground facilities in the west of America. And while details are to be taken with a pinch of salt, this apparent battle occurred in the late 1970s and was seemingly brought about by a straying from the agreement on the Grey Aliens part. Interestingly or not, while abductions began to steadily increase beginning in the 1960s and even more so in the 1970s, as the 80s came into view, claims of alien abduction were becoming more and more common. Might this tie in with the apparent breakdown of relations between the shadow government and this grey alien race, or at least their representatives here on Earth? Of course, whether this incident occurred is very much open to debate, as are what the consequences were for those on both sides. Indeed, might the claims of a secret war taking place behind the scenes be more accurate than most of us might think? Okay, so here's another possibility. Perhaps the world's governments, perhaps particularly so the United States, are studying UFO sightings, but are doing so in the knowledge that at least some of them are the result of natural phenomena in our atmosphere. Now, according to a 2016 interview with the BBC, one-time government UFO investigator for the British Ministry of Defence, Nick Pope, would claim that the ultimate dirty secret of UFOs, at least from a military point of view, was the cases that appear to be natural aerial phenomena. And it was these cases that were, and likely still are, of most interest to most militaries around the world. Essentially, if these natural weather phenomena can be understood and even harnessed and possibly replicated, from a military perspective, they can be weaponized. Of course, to many in the UFO community, particularly those with non-military ties, this would be quite horrific. That not only would the issue of UFOs prove to be nothing more than a natural phenomenon of our own environment, but the continuous study of such sightings could result in a potentially deadly weapon, the existence of which, in whosever hands it might end up, would bring the world one step closer to annihilation. One of the things that is of interest to us here in terms of Pope's comments is a revelation that some of the UFO sightings the world's governments are studying are indeed plasma flares in the atmosphere. As tentative as this alleged statement might be, it certainly sits in sympathy with Pope's comments. Could governments be looking to weaponize such phenomena? And if so, what happens if they succeed? Would we see the testing and possible targeted use of this new kind of destructive weapon, and would it usher in a whole new terrible era? Or might this phenomenon be put to good use, perhaps used as an alternative energy, albeit one that would very likely be monetized in the same way that fossil fuels are? This is perhaps one notion that we should keep a very close eye on in the coming years. There is, however outrageous it might sound to some, the possibility that it is not the governments of the world per se that are keeping this UFO and alien presence a closely guarded secret, but the aliens themselves. 
Indeed, there are many researchers who subscribe to the notion that an extraterrestrial presence remains in control of humanity, and what's more, they have done so since the beginning of time when they were called the gods. With that in mind, it is perhaps worth reminding ourselves that we live in an era where almost everything we see and do is recorded, and much of that information we volunteer ourselves without really questioning where it is going, or for what reason. Who exactly is monitoring this build-up of data on each one of us, and from where? Might the reason for such constant monitoring of our movements not be for our own protection, but to build up a database right for exploitation? particularly if the end user of this information is a collective, not officially recognised by government controls, nor by the vast majority of the population. Indeed, such dismissiveness on one side and complete disinterest on the other, at least in theory, makes control of the entire population quite possible by not only a relatively small number of people, but an apparent invisible covert rule, one that there are no records of, and that is never spoken about. Indeed, those inspecting this wealth of information could be viewed as the watchers of our modern times. Of course, if there is any truth to such notions of an alien presence maintaining control over humanity from behind the scenes, then not only would we have to re-evaluate what we think we know about UFOs and aliens, but also our history, and the nature of our reality. Perhaps the most intriguing, and even most credible reason for UFO secrecy, relates to the propulsion systems of these strange craft. Before we get into the possible reasons for that, we'll quickly go over what, if true, could be one of the most downplayed incidents in UFO history. On a perfectly still and serene evening in the Aztec Desert, New Mexico, on 25th of March 1948, a blazing disc-shaped object screamed out of the sky and embedded itself in the sandy ground. The United States military was soon on the scene. They would transport the wreckage to White Sands Air Force Base. The craft was a series of rings that seemingly rotated around a central cabin. The material was of a strength unknown to the military, yet at the same time it was as light as aluminium. The whole thing, as is the case with other UFO reports, appeared to be made from one whole piece of material. It would take almost two weeks to fully move the ruined craft, as well as the remains of the vehicle though, were the bodies of several alien beings. Another UFO investigator, Glenn Campbell, would also pick up on the Aztec incident. The source of many of Campbell's reports was a man named Alfred. Not only was he present at the aforementioned incident, but he spent considerable time in the company of high-ranking scientists. According to Alfred, his official job was a technical photographer at a nuclear test base. He would speak to Campbell about a particular conversation between himself and German physicist Otto Krauss. If true, it could be one of the most important conversations in history. According to Alfred's conversation with Krauss, not only was the Aztec and Roswell incidents real, but both of the crashes would offer up alien beings as well as the ruins of highly advanced craft. Furthermore, both of the vehicles were subject to reverse engineering. Krauss would tell Alfred it took them a long time to get into the thing and figure out how it worked. That was what was the classified part of the UFO, the mechanism that powered it, that was more classified than the atom bomb. It is perhaps worth our time here examining some of the statements of Gary McKinnon, who while hacking into the computer systems of the NSA, told the BBC the reasons for his search was there are some very credible, relied upon people, all saying yes, there is UFO technology, there's anti-gravity, there's free energy, and it's extraterrestrial in origin, and they've captured spacecraft and reverse engineered it. Now, as fanciful and outlandish as it might sound to some that firstly, free or natural energy exists, and second, that governments and corporations would suppress this information, a quick examination of both points brings into focus how real this notion likely is. In short, you have to realise just how much money connects to the energy market, and just how far and how many different ways its reach stretches into all aspects of modern life. Perhaps we should also examine the claims of Dr. Stephen Greer, undoubtedly a controversial person, but one whose claims resonate with many others around the world. It is Greer's belief that alien technology is already in existence behind the closed doors of the world's government, and what's more, a disclosure of this information and a releasing of these technologies into the public arena would likely lead to a cheaper and more reliant form of energy for people all over the planet. 
energies and technologies that the third world could use to transform their respective outlooks almost overnight. It is also Greer's opinion that those in power have no desire whatsoever to see their influence or their financial standing suffer in any way. Consequently, a suppression of such technologies is widespread throughout the elite ruling factions of the world. Bob Lazar has also made some rather intriguing claims, suggesting the propulsion systems of these futuristic vehicles are of real interest to the militaries and governments, or at least a select part of the government, the shadow government. Lazar first entered the public arena in the late 1980s, when, during an appearance on Las Vegas television in an interview with respected journalist George Knapp, he would claim to be in the employment of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, where, among other things, he worked with alien technology. News outlets around the world would pick up the piece, as would newspapers and magazines, each with varying amounts of sensationalism. Despite official denials from the Los Alamos National Laboratory that Lazar had ever been in their employment, Knapp's research would reveal a very clear paper trail, and it suggested that Lazar was being truthful. According to Lazar, he would first come into contact with the agency in 1982. He would go through an intense and drawn-out interview conducted over many different meetings. He eventually, he claimed, received Q clearance, and not just Q clearance either, 38 levels above that clearance. In terms of the projects that he would work on, Lazar would state that Congress, in his opinion, was likely not aware as a governing body of the work that was going on. From what he could gather, the projects began in the late 1940s and were quickly sealed off and off limits to outsiders. He would assert that the crafts he had seen had three gravity amplifiers on their underside. These amplifiers would have their energy focused to a desired destination, and the craft would go there. Or more to the point, the destination would go to the craft. Lazar would describe this by stating if the craft was a big stone on a sheet of stretchy material, the gravity technology would pull the desired destination to it. This is literally bending space and time. Once the gravity amplifier is shut down, space, or the stretchy sheet, retracts back to its original point, only now it takes the craft, or the stone, with it. Lazar would further attest that travelling like this in deep space is relatively simple. This due to there being little or no gravity to affect travel. The gravity technology manufactures this gravitational pull, distorting and bending space, and then simply rides the wave as it goes back to its original point. When travelling on planets, however, and particularly Earth, due to its strong gravitational pull, this travel becomes much more difficult and unstable. According to Lazar, the intense weather systems also interfere with this equipment. To overcome these conditions, the crafts have to ride the gravity of the Earth, and use their gravity generators to do so. This, according to Lazar, is also the reason why many people claim to see a craft one moment, and then have it vanish right before them the next. Similarly, for those sightings of orbs or lights in the sky that seem to dart around in a zigzag motion, what is actually happening is the craft is riding the wave of space retracting to its original position. Lazar further offered this is why some people can see UFOs and others can't. You could be standing right under it, and if the gravity generators are in the correct configuration, all you will see is the sky he would offer. At the same time, another group of people could be so far to the left or right of those under the invisible craft and see it clear as day. It just depends how the field is bent. This technology and manipulation of gravity and space-time also accounts for the often described breakneck 90 degree turns at the speed of light. Lazar would state that this was simply time and space distortion that was taking place. Is Lazar correct with how these apparent alien craft operate, as well as the secrecy behind them? And does it all come down to the propulsion system and how that can be best used, perhaps even weaponized? And above all else, could it really be that rather than some of the other more dramatic reasons there could be for UFO secrecy, that it is nothing more than the propulsion systems of these admittedly potentially highly advanced vehicles that have kept their existence top secret? And is a large part of the reason for that nothing more than to maintain the lofty profits of a very select few. Indeed, could it be that money is at the heart of the UFO and alien question? In the interest of balance, we should also consider the possibility that there are no secrets to keep, and that the world's governments have already, by and large, told of what they know about UFOs. 
And while that is a hard prospect to contemplate seriously, even for some sceptics, it is possible. Could it really be that the notion of governments keeping knowledge of UFOs and extraterrestrials secret from the public is nothing more than a conspiracy theory that has spun out of control across the decades? Is it really possible, for example, for multiple different administrations in many, many countries across the world for almost 80 years to have kept such a secret? When considered in such black and white terms, it would indeed appear unlikely. However, it is certainly not beyond the realm of possibility. There are certainly enough whistleblowers, investigators and researchers who have arrived at just such a conclusion, that certain governments around the world, working alongside each other, sometimes begrudgingly, have managed to by and large keep the nature of UFOs, and indeed their official existence, a secret from the general public. And this has been achieved if we also accept such assertions to be absolute truth for a moment through a series of disinformation campaigns, false disclosures and if certain claims involving such organisations as the men in black are to be believed through outright intimidation. We have to accept if such secrets have been kept in discreet multi-country packs then it forces us to examine our world and the real machinations that make it turn. It could very well be the case that the truth is a lot stranger than some of the wildest theories. As we have seen then, there are many reasons that governments around the world might be keeping UFO sightings secret. And while some are perhaps more plausible than others, regardless of some of the potentially valid reasons for such a stance, knowledge of intelligent life elsewhere in the universe should surely not be something that is kept hidden from the world's population. Indeed, while some of the reasons we have examined are understandable, rightly or wrongly, the result of such a public stance, particularly in light of the mounting evidence that these sightings and reports of encounters are not merely misidentified craft or outright hoaxes, allows the void to be filled with speculation. And while that is no bad thing, on the surface, this creates an atmosphere of distrust between those in charge and the general public. If, for example, a sudden decision to disclose all that is known on the subject of UFOs, even if this was a genuine full disclosure, there is a good chance that at least large portions of the public would not trust the information, or suspect that there was more to be revealed. We have to remember, this is a secret that has been kept for over three quarters of a century, at the very least. It certainly gives us a lot to think about. For now, I will simply thank you for joining me, and be sure to leave any thoughts in the comments, and check out the links for further reading of some of the cases and theories we have been discussing here today. Remember to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media to keep up to date on future podcasts, articles and videos. And if there is anything you want us to feature on future podcast episodes, perhaps you have witnessed the UFO yourself, or you just have a theory that you wish us to explore, then get in touch with me at marcus at ufoinsight.com. Until next time, goodbye and take care.